Mona Scott Young, thank you for, for joining us. Um, you wear more hats than I can imagine. And I, I do a few, but you really do a lot. Uh, we'll get to the main project in a second, but correct me here if I'm wrong. Talent manager, executive producer, producer, uh, and CEO and founder of your company, Monami. Did I pronounce Monami that? Monami Entertainment Productions, very well Mon pronounced. Monami Productions, or is in the Midwest, I would say Monami. Monami <laughs> Productions, Monami Entertainment. Um, and, and you really do wear several hats and, and a major production going on right now. Six episode series. Everybody loves Natty. We'll get to that in a second. A little background. You, you, did you start as a talent manager? I did. I did. And many people forget that now that I've been doing television for so long. But uh, for 26 years, I managed, oh, gosh, a ton of recording artists. I had a company in urban entertainment called Violator Management with my partner, the late Chris Lighty. And we managed everyone from Mariah Carey to Ella Cool J, 50 Cent, Busta Rhymes. I still manage Missy Elliott to this day, Tribe Called Quest, uh, Fantasia. It was a pretty rock star list of talent. But I did that for a very long time. And then around 2005, I did a show with Missy Elliott called The Road to Stardom. And that's where I got big by the producing, bit by the producing bug. And in 2008, I started Mona Me Productions. What, what got you into the, into the, all of it is entertainment. What, what's the bug? What, you, you grew up in New York, right? I grew up in New York, but what was interesting is didn't really listen to the radio much. I wasn't really a music person, but I always say that you've got to be able to recognize your gifts and lean into them. What I think I was good at, it was recognizing talent in other people, whether that talent was musical or otherwise, and, and helping them be the best versions of themselves. And I found that that translated into being a good manager because my job was to help my talent, my clients, be the best versions of themselves and put out the best product that they could. And so you're putting them into productions, you're, you're putting them out there, so to speak, and then you said, I can do this, I can produce. What I said was, wow, what else do you want to do, Mona? You've done this for these clients for so many years. There are so many things that you still aspire to that you have yet to even scratch the surface of. What do you want to do next? And I had no idea, but I knew that, you know, it wasn't what I was doing currently. And although I still say that I take being a manager with me into producing, I just knew that I wanted to try different things. And television production was one of those things. And it was lightning in a bottle. My first foray. What was your first foray? Well, I should say my second foray, because my first foray was The Road to Stardom with Missy Elliott. So it was an eliminatory music competition show. We got all of these aspiring hopefuls on a bus and we eliminated them along the way and left them on the side of the road, literally, as they got eliminated. So that was the first show that I did. And then Love and Hip Hop was the second. And, and the bug bitch. Now you said, I'm going to produce television. I like this. I like and, it. And, and what makes for a good producer? Some people don't know what a producer really does. I think for unscripted, especially doc you follow specifically, human curiosity, right? Wanting to understand people and help them tell their stories and wanting to bring those stories to a mass audience. Because I think there are just so many experiences that make us different, but then there are so many things about the lives that we all live that make us the same. And that relatability factor and seeing yourself reflected in someone else's story and realizing that all of the things that you thought made us different are not so different after all, right? And it might be kind of this idealistic view of it, but I think telling stories that people can relate to and finding that intersection of aspirational meets relatable is just something that I enjoy doing and seeing it all come together. Show after show, production after production brings us right up to date with Everybody Loves Natty. Everybody. Six episode series. Yep. Natty and Natasha, First of all, how did this come to be? How did you two of you get together? 
It was interesting because I was looking to do something in the Latin space, looking, you know, to see how I could broaden the, you know, scope and scale of the the demographics that we um, were creating content for. And uh, I came across Nati. My daughter squealed when she heard her name. So I was like, okay, this is the one. And we had a mutual um, associate who actually is a co-executive producer on the show, Artie Pabone, who is there, um, who works with them in their marketing department. And he introduced us. And at first I was like, mm, she's not the type who want, who's going to do, you know, docu-series because she's notoriously private. She's got this perfectly curated life on social media. And I'm sure she's probably not going to want to pull that curtain down. Interestingly enough, what I didn't know is that she had all of these life-changing things that were just around the corner. And mm-hmm. she wanted to be able to share her life with the world in a much different way than she had done to date. And so it was kind of the perfect marriage, me needing stories to tell and her having a hell of a story she wanted to tell. And so we got together and the rest is history. It's her six story. episode, six episode history. Six oh. episode, her story. Yes. Of all of these incredible milestones in this superstar's life. She is a phenomenal, you, you, you talk about uh, social media. Uh, YouTube, what is she, 75 million hits? Or, I, it's, oh, God. It's, it's astronomical numbers, and I wish I had the stats. I know she has like, oh, God, 36 million followers. The impressions aggregated are through the roof because they're mm-hmm. highly engaged, her audience. Do you understand how, how she got, besides being a wonderful talent, how mm-hmm. she got to that point how she utilized social media. Do you actually understand where she's coming from on that? Well, what I do know about her and, and, you know, another talent similar to Nati that I worked with was a little someone named Cardi B. And people would always say like, how did you know? As a manager, I'd be lying if I said there's any secret formula. It's just this combination of elements. But the First and foremost thing I would say is the vulnerability that people like Cardi, like Nati, are able to share and show to their fans that they connect to. A little background about about Cardi, uh, about Cardi, about Nati. Uh, Grew up Dominican Republic? Grew up in the Dominican Republic, had an opportunity to come to the you know, United States, came to New York, had no papers, was undocumented, was told that for all of the reasons that we all know, she would never make it mm-hmm. and just stuck with it and believed in herself and didn't listen to the naysayers. And look at her story now. There is a little bit of commonality, maybe a lot of commonality with the two of you. She says something that's very interesting um, in, in one of the segments, and, and that is she was out to break glass ceilings. Mm. I think you were too. Am I wrong? Now? Absolutely. And although Nati's story being, you know, first generation is, is, you know, in the Latin world, it's very similar to my own. You know, my mother from Haiti, my father as well, didn't have much of an education, but I knew the resources that I had been given. And that is what Nati and I share, that kind of sheer will of wanting to be successful, wanting to have something different to offer to our children. And we bonded over that. And as women, you know, wanting to be able to live our lives and and create our paths on our own terms and, and be the masters of our own destiny, that's absolutely something that we bonded over as well. Biggest challenge for you producing this series was was what covid first and foremost and rafi insisting that i speak spanish while on set the second (laughs) all right let's get to rafi yes (laughs) tell us about rafi he is the quintessential (laughs) you know it's interesting because he's got a sense of humor that i think people don't expect because he's got this larger than life persona. He's, you know, just a badass when it comes to the, the, the talent that he's managed and the business that he runs. But this guy with his little tiny puppy loopy is like mush, right? When you see him with Vita, their baby, even with Nati, she's got him wrapped around her finger, but he is the sweetest human being loves a good cup of coffee, but you know, just a surprising talent because he's just so funny. But he is her manager in a sense. 
her <laughs> production person, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Um, her confidant, and, uh, and, and they're having a baby together. And yeah. I would say they're partners. They're partners. In the truest sense of it, because again, one of the other things that I, I, I'm really proud of with Nati is she, you know, has created her own path as an artist, but also doesn't subscribe to the notion that she is this, you know, female talent who has been molded by her manager, who she also happens to be in a relationship with. I think that's why they kept it secret for so long because she wanted to make sure that she was respected. And I think Rafi did as well as first and foremost, not only a talented artist, but someone who is very confidently and boldly shaping her own career. And putting this all together with Amazon, mm -hmm. that's where you come in. Did, did yes. you pitch this? Did you? I, I did. And they were tremendous partners because they said they wanted to, you know, create and, and continue to build their audience and, and have offerings for their Latin audience. And when I brought this, you know, Nazi show to the table, they immediately, you know, kept their word and, and committed to the show. And we did it through a, a pandemic, right? And with all kinds of curveballs, with all of the things she had going on in her life being thrown at us. And they stayed committed to the show and have been tremendous partners in this. And we're excited about what this means for, you know, the audience, the massive Latin audience that they have on the platform. How, where did you do most of the shooting? She's South Florida? In Miami. Miami. Yeah, we shot most of it in Miami. We, we do take a trip. I don't know if I want to divulge, but, you know, it's mainly in uh, in Miami where they live. Well, you can pique our interest with whatever you want on, on this. Yeah. It, really, it sounds. You no, know, we do take a trip, and and you know, not Rafi talks about, and so does Nati how important their roots are to them, and even this expansion that they wanted to do with doing the show or you know exposing her music to an audience, a new audience, had less to do, had more to do with bringing her Latin audience to and 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 her music and her culture to a global audience than it did with jumping ship. And, and finding a new, you know, audience. Couple more questions. Number one, docu-series. What is it about docu-series that have really come into vogue right now? I just think that people are fascinated. Social media has given them, you know, a front row seat to people's lives day in, day out. And, you know, they're fascinated about not only seeing how the quote unquote other side lives, but that other side isn't necessarily always affluent or celebrity because we've seen a lot of success with shows that are just about a subculture, a world that we're not familiar with. And being able to kind of see those points of commonality, seeing something you recognize and realizing that we're all connected, I firmly believe that that is a huge part of the success of, you know, docu-series television. People watching from all walks of life, watching people from all walks of life and finding something that they recognize or connect with. And finally, what are you hoping the viewer is this uh, premieres and hits November 19th? It's going to run and rerun. What are you hoping the viewer comes away with? I mean, I, I hope that they recognize the sheer joy of all of the, you know, this moment in Nati's life, everything she's experiencing. She talks openly about the struggles that she had with becoming pregnant and to be able to share in that moment with her when she, you know, sees her baby for the first time, when she has her baby. They're just all of these special life-changing moments that we were so thrilled to be able to share. And I hope people also take away that, you know, You've just got to keep dreaming and dreaming big and striving for those dreams and not allowing yourself to be deterred. So it's a message of inspiration. It's hopeful. It's joyous. I use that word a lot when talking about the show. It's joyful. And I just think we can all use a little bit of joy right now. We certainly can. So Mona Scott Young, keep dreaming. Uh, for the both of you, keep, keep breaking those glass ceilings and um, continued success. It's Everybody Loves Natty. It is on Amazon Prime Video, and uh, uh, look forward to talking with you again. Go get them. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much, Mona.